Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we're going to talk about my favorite 80s Les Paul, the Gibson Spotlight Special. So to fully understand these really weird, unique Les Pauls, we need to do a little bit of history. So, the 70s and 80s, they're not necessarily well known for, like, the best guitars that Gibson has ever made, and there were a lot of haters of these. However, people have started to appreciate these things in recent years because, A, they're getting nostalgic, and B, they're realizing there's so many cool limited edition models. But the biggest reason why people don't like these is change. They hate change. <laughs> And when Gibson changed ownership in the late 60s to the Norland era division, change was rampant. So when the Les Paul came back in 68, everything was looking pretty good at first, but then they started to add volutes. We get the introduction of the giant boat paddle headstocks. A little bit later on, we have the introduction of pancake body construction, which is two slabs of mahogany joined together with a maple slab in the center. And then around 75 to 76, we transitioned to maple necks. Now, maple necks ended around 82, 83. It was a whole transition period. And in that same transition, transition period is the introduction of the whole nine hole weight relief system. But tucked into there, you have so many limited editions like 2550 anniversaries, you've got the artisans, there's the artists, and then we get all the prehistoric reissues that you can check out in these videos. But then there's this guy, my absolute favorite, the Spotlight Special. So what makes these things interesting is the fact that they have a two piece maple top that is separated by a walnut center stripe. Now, full disclosure, there are a few that are mahogany, but the bulk majority are walnut like this. This one. And there's always been a bunch of rumors online that these were like new old stock 50s tops that were just cut too short. Nah, according to Randy Leonard, who, you know, actually made some of these things, they weren't left over from the 50s. They just happened to be beautiful maple that was cut a little bit too short and they had some walnut on hand from like the, the Paul series and stuff. And they just slapped these things together for fun. So it kind of gives you that cool neck through vibe without actually being neck through. And just in case you're not familiar, neck through is like a firebird. The neck goes through the body. A lot of times Sometimes people will accidentally refer to a Les Paul as neck through, but what this is is a set neck. It's glued in, whereas your other option is a bolt-on neck, where they screw it into the guitar fender style. This is called Antique Sunburst, abbreviated ASB. There's another one called Antique Natural, A-N-T. And these guys got special serial numbers on the back. You have the year of production and then what number they are. This one is 42, the answer to everything. So how many of these beauties did they make? Well, the number that circulates online is 211. But I I've seen duplicate serial numbers within the ASB and ANTs before, so I mean it's possible there could be 422, but then you also have to remember these were not only made in 1983 like a lot of outdated sources might tell you. We've since seen numbers in 84, going up to around like 12 or so if I remember correctly, and I have seen at least one in 1985, though that was probably like some sort of a warranty replacement. So the main year of production is 1983 for these, but yeah, of course you have to have asterisks and like the prototypes that we've also seen show up in Japan. That's technically a 1982. So 82 to 85 is fair game, but most of them 83. That's what you need to know. But besides their interesting serial number, they're pretty basic Les Pauls of the era. They're not like prehistoric reissues that have the ABR1 bridge. They just happen to be nice. We still got the high-end Tim Shaw electronics in here, stock anyways. No fancy coil splitting or anything like that that you could find on a few models in this day and age. But generally speaking, these have very nice tops. Now this is a version of what I call a two-facer. You get a ridiculously quilty side on this one, and then the other side, eh, not so much. It's kind of plain, but it does have some figuring in the right light situations. And due to each and every one of these being a little bit different, there's a lot of collectors out there that are just like me that are enamored with these things. They first found them in a book and ever since they've wanted to own every single one ever made. <laughs> I kind of fall into that category. I was once badly addicted to these. I think at one point in time I had five or six in my personal collection that I then had to sell off. And then this guy I got from a different collection that I bought from somebody that you can check out this unboxing video right here. But why are we reviewing this one today? It's it's because I, I think I'm going to put it on the chopping block. I've got other guitars I could buy with this. I, I don't really need five spotlights. And this one's a little bit more player's grade. So to learn more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs before we get to a playing sample of this one. Hey 
an hour of cleaning and I'm no longer so keen to sell this thing. Man. So a little bit of scratch remover, some polishing, just really brought this thing back to life. Now I might be wondering, why on earth did you spend all that time polishing a beaten, road-worn guitar? It's because this thing was literally sticky to the touch. Like, it was just not so nice of a player because of that. The frets were all rusted, the strings were garbage. Now this thing is looking quite spectacular. So let's learn a little bit about Spotlight Specials. A lot of parts have been replaced on this, but the heart and soul is still here. I was very excited to lift these out because remember, I bought this collection sight unseen as far as like electronics and stuff go, so it could have been anything in here. But we still have our original Tim Shaw PAF dating to 1983 in the neck position, and then sadly, our bridge pickup is also still original. I was worried about that one. But that dates to the eighth month of 1983 and this one was in November of 83. Within the circuit, the bridge pickup reads 7.09k ohms, so that's about right. Our neck, 7.27, and our middle position, just for fun, 3.59. That's typically what Tim Shaw's read, between seven to seven and a half. But something that's uncommon to see on these yet are the patent applied for stickers on the side of the rings. Those are factory stock. And the fact that this one was played so much and they never wore off, I mean, that one's kind of wore off, but they're still there, is an absolute miracle. And unfortunately, our pickup ring has cracked right here, but it's okay, it still works. But as far as our pickup cavity, we have an A and ASB, antique sunburst, and I never quite figured out what the letter stamps are. You see those in this era though. But here's a cool cross section of the guitar. Body right here, the walnut stripe, and then the maple top. So the walnut stripe is just as thick as the maple top. You can see that here in the bridge pickup cavity as well. And here we have a number three, eight pound sign. I wonder if the body itself is eight pounds, I hope not. And then 316, some sort of a sign off, I guess. That's always fun looking inside these old spotlights because every single one's unique to me. I used to restore these back to original, but now I like to keep them, you know, just the way they were because there's a story behind these individual ones. It's kind of like bursts. Some of them have fanciful stories behind them and that's what makes them so special. So a part that's been replaced on this are our bridge and tailpiece setup. And they were replaced for good reason. So you might think, oh, is that an ABR1 bridge? Uh, it's kind of a knockoff of one. It says, all pure brass, Tokiwa, Japan. So yeah, you can bet your butt. Th these all brass parts are probably worth some money because they're vintage in their own right. Now I was telling you earlier, spotlights are not prehistorics because they do not have a true APR1 bridge. They do have a bushing in the body. So they're supposed to be a Nashville style bridge. But thankfully they have some sort of like a conversion post within the body that fits the original studs. Or maybe they swapped them out, I'm not really sure. But it fits on it now. It's possible these could be the original one because the fact that these still have these black spacers, this is what you would find on the shortly lived top adjust three point bridge. Although I've never seen one of those stock on a spotlight, that doesn't mean that this one didn't leave the factory with one. And we've got our tailpiece here. It's all pitted and whatnot, but this feels a little bit heavier than normal. I mean, it's got the same casting mark that they originally had, but this feels like maybe it's also a brass replacement, which would make sense on a player's guitar. But now let's just take a second to appreciate the beauty of this guitar crazy quilt. I had an old one that was a beat up player's grade one just like this that had a top like this on both sides, but somebody had worn through the finish because they had played it so much in the picking area. So what's great about this is you have wood grain, figuring, and a whole bunch of checking running up and down this. I'll try to get you guys some outside shots that I can share with you just to really appreciate the aged nature of this one. Then down here you got a whole bunch of nicks and dings, uh, who knows what it's from, just general gigging wear and tear I would assume. You can see some more of the whole finish checking stemming along here. I mean it cleaned up greatly and now it can really show off all of those battle scars. And hey, you know, this piece is not so bad at certain angles. It's not as plain as most of the photos make it want to see. So it's still a little bit of a two-face, but it's not the plainest two-face I've ever seen. But you've got a big nasty scar right here because of the uh, pick guard. But thankfully, we can just put that back on and then you don't see it. So our toggle switch looks like this. Uh, this looks pretty well original to me. 
However, the knobs have definitely been replaced because spotlights come with my favorite style 50s top hat knob, and this one has speed knobs. Now, this looks era correct, but they were probably replaced very early on because these have better speed grips. So it would not surprise me to see that these black light and match the rest of the guitar, but definitely not stock. So these have a mahogany body two-piece maple top with a center seam of walnut, as we were talking earlier. Do they have weight relief or not? I don't know, because 83, technically, there would be nine hole weight relief. I would be willing to bet that. Probably, but I have not x-rayed one of these before. It could be that it was a special model, so they decided not to. But anyways, moving on from our body, take a look at this. Oh yeah, those frets look much better. Now, judging by the rest of the condition of this thing, I thought for sure these frets were going to be like goners. But surprisingly, very little wear and tear to these guys. That tells me it's probably been leveled and recrowned a few times. But I actually have high hopes that this should play and sound pretty darn good. However, if you like big, tall frets, yeah, you probably don't want an 80s Les Paul. These are kind of low and wide even stock from the factory. Like they have a little bit of a crown to them, but they do take some getting used to. I will warn you about that. But you've got 22 frets on this one with a nut width of 1.68 inches, which increases to 2.05 by the 12th. First fret necked up 0.87, and that increases to 0.98 by the 12th. Here's what that neck profile looks like at the first and 12th fret, just a standard rounded C-shaped neck. That's the one thing that I don't really like about spotlights are their necks are a little bit thin. Not like super pencil thin, they have a nice little roundedness to it, but occasionally, very occasionally, you can find big neck spotlights. Generally, they're antique naturals though. I have not found an ASB with a big neck yet. But granted, I've only owned maybe 7% of the population. <laughs> humble brag, humble brag. Here we go. Headstock time. This thing has definitely been a little bit beat up here. You've got some chip within the lacquer. The Gibson logo has yellowed over and chipped in some areas. I mean, this was not babied by any means, but it was somebody's baby. And I love that it tells that tale. We'll take a look about the tuner situation on the backside here, but you can definitely tell that there's some lacquer wear right here because of swapped tuners and things like that. The truss rod on this one, it's not maxed out, but it's definitely getting towards that limited adjustability area. Maxed out is like when this thread is sticking all the way up here and for knowing how much this thing was played i would say that's not half bad on that one the truss rod covers on these are just your regular style and they are blank moving on to the backside now a couple of additional modifications but remember the heart's still good we've got our original 1983 dated cts pots so 137 83 looks like 32 or something like that so pretty late 1983 pots however we can definitely tell that the pickups have been at least in and out once on this one because those are not the original solder joints so it's great that the original pickups are back in here because those things are expensive to replace but my favorite thing to look for in this era of guitars are the initials of the leonard family and Unfortunately, this one does not have any of Randy or Floyd's markings in here, but that doesn't mean they didn't work on it necessarily. They just like to mark the really special ones. But an additional modification that somebody has done in here is we have a shielding strip right here. And you can see our original backplate must have had like a set list or something right there on it, but the backside has also been shielded off. And the same thing is true here on the toggle switch. They have a shielded off compartment right here, but you can see, uh-oh, lazy guitar tech didn't pay attention to where he was screwing in the holes, putting one of these things back on. So we have twice as many holes as we need. Another replaced part here are our strap buttons. Not a big deal. This one could probably use to be filled and redrilled or the toothpick trick or something. It moves a little bit, but it's good enough enough to play for now. But the condition is just well road worn. You've got all your buckle worming here, not too much rash that breaks the finish, just a few nicks and dings where it kind of rashes through the side right here. You must have like some sort of a belt buckle or something, but the rest is just nicks and dings kind of like what we saw on the top and you got a whole bunch of finish checking, but that's kind of all hard to see. The binding has typical cracking in it, that just happens. It makes the guitar look old. Generally, binding doesn't flake off, that's just expansion and contraction showing. But that doesn't mean that it's never fallen off, a lot of times those cracks are just in the finish. But one reissue style spec is the thin binding in the cutaway, so you're seeing the maple top exposed. And then some more wear down here.
But man, this neck is so beautiful after I cleaned it up. I've never seen a ringy neck like that. That is cool. I love that mahogany wood grain that they've got going on here. Now, occasionally in spotlights, you can find one piece mahogany necks and three piece mahogany necks. It's the three piecers that are generally bigger. So I guess that's another thing you can use if you want a fat neck spotlight. Find one of those three piece necks. So far, that has held true for me. But you've got nicks and dings back here. There's kind of a, a deeper gouge right there. It's really just the finish is flaked off. But that's a nice smooth player now. And despite as often as this one was gigged, I don't see any breaks, cracks, or repairs. I mean, we'll blacklight it just to be certain. But you do have some stand hanger rash around here, as you would be expecting to see. But now our tuners. We have a pair of 70s, 80s Schaller branded Schallers, which were high-end tuners back in the day. I mean, the Gibson branded ones were made by Schaller, and they're still great tuners even yet today. But these originally shipped with Klusen tuners. You can see the Klusen right here. It wouldn't surprise me if there was Grovers on it at one point in time. It looks like maybe a cheapy tuner that was like maybe installed upside down maybe because you generally don't see holes in those locations, but you do see it there. Now you could fill those in if you really wanted to, but we'll just leave them there because maybe somebody wants different tuners on here, but they are not the original and there's been a whole bunch of them in here. This one was made in USA, 1983. 42nd in production, and then this was a marked factory second. That's what SEC stands for, and that's not because the neck was bad or the body wasn't pieced together right. That is some sort of a cosmetic blemish brand new, or sometimes employee guitars that went home with them, they would mark them seconds to get a discount. So for example, brand new, it's got a ding right here, factory second. Nowadays, it's, it's got so much wear and tear. Factory seconds don't generally affect value. However, if there's like six or seven other guitars on the market that aren't seconds, you're going to have to discount your second to sell before the other ones, because generally somebody would prefer a first. So I always get asked that question, is a factory second worth less? No, but with an asterisk. <laughs> it depends when you want to sell it. Then of course we get our custom shop edition decal right here. The first guitar that I fell in love with that whole decal. Just a quick recap, that means it was a limited edition of some sort, not made in a particular custom shop like we think of it today. That didn't open till late 1993. This was made on the same production line as everything else, but it received a little bit more special attention as far as, you know, the decal work. And condition wise, yeah, I mean, it's, it's beat up, but it's not too bad. As far as the blacklight test goes, everything looks the way I was expecting to see. Those are definitely old vintage knobs themselves, and even our pick guard does glow nicely despite not being a 100% perfect fit. It's probably original, but who knows. So the body looks good. Let's move on up the fretboard here to our headstock. Nothing too surprising here, obviously just the finish wear that we were looking at earlier. And here you can really see those rings around the tuning pegs and some more of the finish checking. Backside of the instrument has a nice even glow. There's an area down here I forgot to show you guys where a strap kind of like chew through the finish. You've got one or two of those. And the other areas we were talking about earlier up here. The worn, but not necessarily abused. And perhaps the most important part, our neck see some impressions. There's a lot of finish checking on the neck too. I don't know if that kind of showed through. It actually looks quite cool how you can see it here under black light in those areas, but no, no breaks, cracks, or repairs. Just our stand rash that we are looking at on the sides. And of course that finished blemish that almost erased some of the serial number. At this lighting angle, you can see there is a little bit of neck finish wear but it's not like all the way through. That's just the clear coat that's been rubbed a bit. Like if you look at it under black light, you can feel a slight difference, like these areas are a little bit faster, but it's not like gloss to nothing gloss. I mean, that's a nice transition right here. All said and done, this one's not too bad in the weight department. Nine pounds, 3.1 ounces. They generally range from about nine to 11, just depending on the example. That's a pretty good weight for one of these. But let's go ahead, plug this one in and hear how it sounds.
This is a really nice sounding spotlight. So our neck pickup, it's got a nice juiciness, but not overly muddy. <laughs> That middle is just so chimey. Got a good transparentness to it. Then I have a love-hate relationship with Tim Shaw bridge pickups. Sometimes they sound good, sometimes not so much. This one's not too bad. This one just has a nice glassy sound to it. No wonder it's played so much. So now that we know all about this particular spotlight special number 42, what are my final thoughts on this thing? You know, when I first started this review, I said, okay, time to thin out the spotlight herd, but you know, now that I've played it, man, there's a reason why this one was played as much as it was. I mean, this is just an absolutely gorgeous example. It really reminds me of my old one. I think it was number 85, something like that, that had the two piece top that looked exactly like the good side on this one. But I was pretty confident that this thing was probably going to be needing a refret very soon, but I was surprised. These frets, I mean, they feel very good for this era. Now remember, these are pretty low wide frets to begin with, but I thought for sure this thing would need like some sort of a level recrown, but no. 
All it needed was a little bit of cleaning and it is just a great playing instrument. Hard to show on camera, but the straightness of the neck is on point. It's just got a little bit of relief in the neck. And believe it or not, I actually had to lower the bridge just a tad and now it's just an excellent playing example. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning about my favorite model once again in a more updated take of my show style. Am I still gonna sell this thing? Uh, I, I don't know, I think I've changed my mind to, you know, if somebody wants to pay me something that's well worth my time to let it go, maybe, just maybe, but yeah, this is just one of those beautiful guitars. It's hard to sell any spotlight, but I'm glad I took some time today to document this one as well as get it back up to tip top playing shape and make it no longer be super sticky. That's all this thing needed was a chance to shine. So thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.